Good evening, friends. We welcome you all to Ortho TV original webinar series. Today we have a dynamic, young and dynamic pediatric orthopedic surgeon from Mumbai, Dr. Mandar Agashe. He has his own Agashe super specialty, pediatric super specialty care, and he's also attached to SRCC Hospital. Besides that, he's also an academician and he's an assistant honorary in BJ Wadia Hospital, where he teaches, uh, where he teaches pediatric orthopedics. So today he's going to talk on a unique topic, pediatric orthopedic x-rays, how to avoid misreading them to avoid misleading the diagnosis. So, and this webinar has been brought to you by an unrestricted educational grant from GSK Consumer, the makers of Iodex Ultra Gel. So over to Dr. Mandar Agashi. Thank you very much, Neeraj. Yes. So, uh, uh, pediatric orthopedic x-rays are something which are, which have tremendous amount of confusion. There are number of factors like trauma, tumors, infections, hip disorders, metabolic disorders, and all of them are confounding factors, which lead to a lot of confusion in the diagnosis. There are some x-rays which are absolutely normal. There are some x-rays which are normal, but with which are variants. There are some which are abnormal, but don't require any special treatment. While most important are those which are abnormal and require special attention or treatment, but which should not be missed. So what I'm going to do is that uh, I have made a small mnemonic, which will lead to better understanding of these pediatric orthopedic x-rays. And the mnemonic is nothing but pediatric, P-A-E, D-I-A, T-R-I-C. So these are these 10 points which help in better diagnosis of pediatric orthopedic conditions. Let's see the first case. This is a six year old female has come to me with severe bilateral genuvalva. As you can see that there is an obvious gross deformity of the knee. Probable skeletal dysplasia. There are other factors also which lead to a probable diagnosis of skeletal dysplasia and I have planned for deformity correction. For any deformity correction around the knee, I will require something known as a scanogram. I'm sure everyone knows what is a scanogram. So it is nothing but an orthoradiograph of both lower limbs, which are AP view, preferably standing if the, the child is cooperative. Is this enough? Is this description of a scanogram enough? Well, I sent for a scanogram and this is what was obtained. As you can see, the gross deformity of the, of the knees which are seen clinically has not been manifested with this x-ray which I obtained. How did this happen? Well, this is a typical thing which happens with every scan, almost every scanogram, especially for a genuvalgum case. What happens is that when you have such a severe deformity and the X-ray technician tries to get a patella facing forward X-ray, he's unable to fit the entire lower limbs in one X-ray plate. What he does is this, that is he externally rotates the limbs so that the, the both lower limbs fit into an x-ray plate and this is how the x-ray is obtained. You can see that the deformity is completely gone and you get an x-ray which looks almost normal. So for that, what you have to do, we should know what exactly do you require from the scanogram. One is the mechanical alignment of the knee and the tibia. So you require the center of the hip, the center of the knee to be in straight line. You should know the mechanical distal lateral distal femoral angle, the proximal tibial uh, tibial angle and you also should know something about the limb length discrepancy. What do you do in order to find out the exact limb length discrepancy? Here it is very important. If you can see that here you can obviously see that there is a shortening of the left lower limb but it is not very manifested here. So how do you do that? You put a small block on the slow, the shorter side so that both the, uh, the iliac wings are in the same line, so that pelvis is squared, and you get an ex exact idea about the exact limb length discrepancy in this case. So the first thing is a proper position. Positioning is exceedingly important when you are looking at angular deformities, especially around the knee. Second is this, A. So you can look at this case. This is an 18 month old female, not, not wearing weight since two days, high grade fever, very irritable child, keeping the lower limb flexed. I saw the child with fever, the inflammatory parameters were raised. I suspected either a septic hip or osteomyelitis. Here the child is, was just not cooperative for any examination 
and this is the prescription. I wrote about pelvis with both hips with right femur, and I told the, the, the radiologist that I am suspecting some infective focus. I got a call from the radiologist. Sir, nothing in the hip of the femur. I know you are suspecting some infection. Do you want us to screen the tibia also? I said, please do. And this is what we found. There was a huge osteomyelitic focus in the upper tibia, which was eventually drained, and the child had an excellent follow-up at two years. As against that, this was a child which I inherited uh, the patient. 28-day neonate who was an NICU graduate for neonatal sepsis had decreased movements of the left lower limb for four days. X-ray was reported as normal, sent for ultrasound by the pediatrician. He wrote ultrasound of both hips and the friendly neighborhood radiologist wrote about all everything about alpha angles and beta angles, everything about DDH, but nothing about the effusion. Finally, we got an X-ray done, again reported as normal. The MRI then picked up a large amount of hip, hip effusion, most likely a septic hip. I drained it through the anterior approach. The hip was completely dislocated, which I tried to relocate, which was successful. However, at the end of one and a half years of follow-up, you can see that there is significant amount of osteomyelitic changes. Now, why was there a difference between the outcome in two cases? Because there was a good communication between the treating clinician and the radiologist. So it's always important to ask or communicate with the radiologist what exactly you want, especially in pediatric hospitals. Let's see with E. Here a neonate comes with the pseudoparalysis of the left upper limb. There was a birth trauma with vigorous pulling during the delivery and there was swelling, tenderness and deformity in the right elbow. So this was the x-ray. This was the right x-ray, right elbow x-ray and this was the left elbow. And this was reported as an elbow dislocation. Is it an elbow dislocation? Well, no. You can see that there is this, the capitulum which is seen and the radiocapitular line is completely intact. What does this mean? It means that the fracture or any cleavage is at a proximal level than the capitulum. So this is nothing but something known as a transphysial injury of the distal humerus. You should know that this is an injury which happens with a posteromedial displacement. You should know about the radiocapitular lines which are intact in certain conditions and which are hampered in certain conditions. Another case, you can see that this was a four-year-old male with a fallen outstretched hand. Again, the x-ray was reported as normal. Is this a normal x-ray? Well, no. You can see that the radiocapitular line is intersecting the humerus proximal to the capitulum and the uh, Mubarak's line is completely hampered. So this was a Montagia fracture dislocation. It's one of the top three causes of medical litigation in orthopedics. You remember about the ulnar bow, the Mubarak's line and the transcapitular line. This requires a complex osteotomy in the form of a corrective ulnar flexion distraction osteotomy which requires for a, for a good outcome. You should remember about the elbow, about the various ossification centers. We all know the uh, pneumonic, which is crito, capitulum, radial head, internal epicondyle, trochlea, olecranon, external epicondyle. And this is how you should diagnose what exactly is the injury around the enigmatic elbow. So E is enigmatic elbow. Be careful about the elbow. Let's see with D. You can see this. Six-year-old boy, fallen outstretched hand, slab was given elsewhere. Comes with x-ray, which is reported as normal. An AP and lateral view. Tenderness is there laterally. What is the diagnosis? Are you satisfied with this x-ray? Do you want a different view? Well, yes, a better x-ray with, without slab. Again, you can see that there is an internal rotation x-ray which shows a displaced lateral, epi, lateral condyle fracture, which is a fracture of necessity and almost always requires surgery. This has a potential to cause significant deformity and which is typically diagnosed with a good quality AP and AP internal oblique x-ray. So teaching point four is get good quality x-rays, preferably immobilize, uh, without immobilization and get different views. Always remember there's more than just two views, get internal rotation and external rotation oblique views. So have different views possible. Let's look at I. This was a nine year old boy, a native of MD, comes with symptoms since three months. So multiple doctors meets with me with anxious relatives. I asked them, many relatives are there. I asked them, kya taklif hai? Sir, he fell down and then he fell down. Then one IT 
guy comes to me and says, sir, we have shown many doctors, many investigations have been done. It is an infected hematoma. It's just that the location is difficult, hence they have referred in here. I examine in the child. You see that there is severe pain and tenderness over, over the upper posterolateral tibia. He is barely able to walk. Has a severe antalgic gait with equinus contract. I look at all the papers. All the papers have written history of trauma. Hence, this is an infected hematoma. Some have even attempted an ultrasound guided tapping. I went back to the history. I asked them, when did he fall down? Well, he fell down four months ago. And since when are his symptoms? Since three months. So I asked him, did he show anyone for trauma? No, no, sir, he did not tell anyone. It is only when he started limping that we insisted that he must have fallen. And he said he may have had a fall one month prior. And this is very typical. This was the first x-ray where the, the primary orthopedic surgeon had labeled something here. Said there is a prob probable epifacial injury with an infected hematoma. But at presentation, you can see that there is a, there is a gross cystic change on the opposite side of the, of the uh, tibia, which has been proved on the MRI. I drained it through, through a posterolateral approach. This is the smear positive TB. So this was not related to the, to the trauma at all. So I went back to the history and what we should always ask, why do you think the trauma is related to the present symptoms? Which means that you should always be very careful when they say something about trauma. Many a time there is a history of trauma and followed by some symptoms. Always Unless there is a specific history where he has fallen down and has taken advice to a doctor, discount this and go back to the history. Infected organized hematoma is almost mythical. It is almost always not known unless in specific conditions like a moral level lesion or a bleeding diathesis. So beware of this term of incidental trauma. Thus, incidental trauma is one thing which is very important for you to diagnose your pediatric orthopedic condition well. Let's look at A. This is an infant, female, first brawn, breech, has a left hip click. Sent for an x-ray. This was the x-ray which was obtained. Reported a normal. Again, x-rayed after a few months, again reported a normal. Finally, this was the x-ray around one year. Again reported a normal. And But we know that this is something which is abnormal. Always draw the lines. Look at the epiphysis, where they are. Draw the Perkins lines, draw the Hilgen Reynolds lines. Try to diagnose DDH early so that you are able to treat them well. Even in this case, you can see that the left hip is grossly abnormal. You can see that it is subluxed. And on the lateral view, you can see that uh, the hip is dislocated and the acetabular index is very high. So draw lines and angles. Angles and lines are extremely important in pediatric orthopedics, especially in around the hip. Because most of the hip is non-ossified non and you have to rely on certain ossified bony parameters in order to diagnose the hip well. Let's look at T. This is an x-ray, very common. 15-year-old boy, athletic, point, pinpoint pain over the upper tibia. Again, a query history of trauma. Diagnosed to have an avulsion of the tibial tuberosity. What is the diagnosis? It's osgood Schlatter's disease. One more. 13 year old female, pain over the lateral side of the foot, foot since four weeks, had a query history of twisting injury and has a point tenderness over the base of foot metatarsis. What is the diagnosis? It's something known as a Zellin's disease. So these are nothing but osteochondrosis or traction apophysitis. There are various of them, Kohler's, Zellin's, osteochondrosis. They are benign conditions in adolescence, almost never require major treatment. What is very important to know is that they are many a times diagnosed as fractures and tried to be treated aggressively. Remember about these traction apophysitis, especially around adolescents. R, you can see this. 14-year-old male, typical habitus, pain in the right thigh and knee since four months. Difficulty in sitting cross-legged and squatting. And these x-rays of the knee have been done. Is this normal, normal but variant, or you require something else? What is very important is get the x-ray of the pelvis done. So you have an adolescent boy with an abnormal gait, with his hobbies or with a pain around the knee, always look at the hip well, always look at the correct joint, get an x-ray of the pelvis. You can see that he has a slipped capital femoral epiphysis, one of the commonest causes of early hip arthritis and medical litigation for misdiagnosis.
So any adolescent with thigh and knee pain, get a pelvis X-ray done. Get the right joint X-ray done. So R is right joint. Remember that there is a significant chance of referred pain, especially in pediatric orthopedics. So you should know exactly which joint is to be investigated. Let's look at I. And this was a case, a newborn, breach, referred for widely abducted position of the hips. And by the time I went to the NICU, everyone, including the neonatologists, the parents, everyone was extremely tense. Child's limb was grossly ab ab abducted and this was the X-ray. And this was reported as a large soft tissue mass in the sacral region. This was a neonate with a large soft tissue mass in the sacral region. Everyone was extremely scared. And I had to do one emergency procedure to treat it. What can it be? I did one emergency procedure and I, this led to complete removal of this mass so that it is now completely absent. What is it? I just removed the diaper. Remember, the diaper is the cause of a large number of these soft tissue masses around the pelvis. Always remember to remove the inner wear, remove the diaper when you are getting a pelvis x-ray done. So inner wear or diaper has to be removed when you are getting a pelvis x-ray in a child. Last but not the least, we have this child, long-standing bow leg deformity, has a trivial fall with inability to bear weight and diagnosed with tibia fracture and plaster. But if you can see, this is the deformity, but this is what is more significant. You can see these large spots, which are cafe play spots. So these are basically a congenital pseudarthrosis of the tibia with neurofibromatosis is one. One of the most difficult conditions to treat for the pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And this requires early referral and complex reconstructive surgery. As again, that you can see this child, a seven month old female, mother noticed swelling around the right shoulder since 15 days. There's no history of trauma. The mother is very specific this time that there is no history of trauma. And he was diagnosed to have fractured clavicle. That's fine. He was given a sling, he was given a strap. Comes with the exactly same looking x-ray after one month. There is no callus. What are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with a non-union? Should we do something like was done for the tibia? Two questions I think we sh you should ask me. Why am I showing a simple case of a fractured clavicle? Or why did I highlight right? Well, basically this is a case of a congenital pseudarthrosis of the clavicle. It's a benign condition which does not require any treatment. Almost always occurs on the right. Remember, if you see a right-sided clavicle non-union in a child who is about 7-8 months old, it's almost always a congenital pseudarthrosis of the clavicle. This does not require any treatment. In fact, if it occurs on the left, it is so very, very important to know that it's almost always on the right. If it occurs on the left, remember to think of something like dextrocardia. It is almost always on the opposite side of the heart. Thus, know of some Hatke conditions or conditions which are unique. So C is conditions which are unique or Hatke. Thus, remember this mnemonic. Finally, I'm going to end with this mnemonic again. P is proper positioning, especially for angular deformities. A is ask or communicate with your radiologist when you're sending for an ultrasound, for an, for an MRI. E, remember about the enigmatical elbow. Remember about the various lines around the elbow. Remember about the epiphyseal ossification centers on the elbow. D, remember about different views, not just the AP and lateral view. Remember about the internal and external oblique views. I is about the incidental trauma. Be very careful when the, when the parents say there is trauma and the X-ray is not fitting with the history of trauma. A, draw various angles and lines, especially around the pediatric hip. Because most of the hip is not ossified. The ossific center of the uh, hip is extremely small. Remember about the traction apophysitis, especially around the adolescent. Don't mistake them from, for fractures. R, remember about SCFE and the referred, joint, referred pain. Get a proper joint x-ray done or the right joint x-ray done. I always get an x-ray of the pelvis in a small child without the diaper. There is a lot of confusion when you get an x-ray done with a diaper. And there are some conditions in the pediatric age group which are unique or hatke. You should know a few of them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mandar. That was an excellent talk. As always. Uh, 
so i had a few questions uh, from you uh, for you so the most commonly uh, missed lesion which i have in my practice is the fracture of the lateral condyle okay so what is the special x ray which should be done for fracture of the supposing if i am suspecting a lateral condyle or any elbow fracture how many views should we take and uh, should we supervise those views how should we go about it yeah so uh, what is very important is that in elbow in my clinical practice it is a rule that it can't be just two views it has to be three views in minimum ap lateral and oblique now that oblique view is something which always needs to be supervised when we say it is oblique the the technician many a times feels that it is something in between ap and lateral but there is a very specific way in which to do an oblique view so what you should remember is that your if you have a elbow fracture the child is going to have a flexion deformity because he is going to be in lot of pain so what you should remember is that the distal humerus has to be kept flat on the the x ray plate and the entire arm should be rotated internally by about 15 to 20 degrees so what happens is that many a time the technician does something different something oblique something weird whatever it is he feels that it is something which is in between ap and lateral view if that is the case that uh, that internal rotation oblique view has no meaning it has to be a very specific internal rotation ap view with an internal rotation given for the entire arm of about 15 to 20 degrees so as a rule in every elbow suspected injury it has to be an ap lateral and an oblique x ray which has to be done what uh, okay that is good now in the uh, in hip and knee confusion which you showed so what happens is that patient comes to you with one type of x ray yeah and for example say he has a problem of scfe that is you suspecting and he has come with a knee x ray okay and you are sitting in a place where x ray will take one and a half hour and your opd is going to get over in half an hour or maybe it's just the last patient who walks in and you are about to finish and you have maybe a second opd starting within like the next half an hour in some other place so how do you manage these type of way because practically it is very difficult see you are sitting in srcc i'm sure it takes at least half an hour to 45 minutes by the time patient comes back with the film yeah so so uh, then we have to grade the severity of of whatever that patient is if the child has come walking uh, with a pain which is there for a long time i'll probably advise him x ray and i'll ask him to come for follow up at a later date at an earliest later date if of course if he is an unstable scfe and he has come with an x ray which was a day or two back when he was walking with a knee x ray i'll probably wait because an unstable scfe is something like an emergency or if he is walking with an antalgic gait i know that this hip pain or the knee pain due to the hip pathology the hip pathology has progressed over time and that is a thing which is an emergent situation and i'll probably wait for the x ray or at least i'll tell my fellow to be very careful see to it that you get a supervised x ray done and communicate with me as early as possible so scfe is a broad diagnosis there are various types of scfe if it's a chronic stable slip i'll probably wait till my earliest next consultation but if it's an unstable or a uh, acute on chronic slip where the child is unable to bear weight i'll probably be much more proactive in getting at that x ray done so basically you will it'll treat it like a fracture neck femur how we treat it a young young fracture neck femur okay. urgent surgery will be required for such patients what about say even after an oblique x ray sometimes we are not able to get that lateral condyle where is very minimal x ray very minimal chip is there or something which you are not able to make out so do you call the patient again for a repeat x ray when you are suspecting you put a slab and do you call these patients for a repeat x ray after one week or something like that does it yeah, make so any difference in the treatment Yeah, so i typically what happens is sometimes i may not be able to get a good quality oblique x ray when the child is has come to me for the first time and is howling and is in severe pain in which case i usually give him a slab i make the child comfortable and i call them back after probably 4 to 5 days or 7 days if i feel clinically that it's something which is slightly less displaced if it's a if clinically i feel if there is a lot of confusion if a lot of swelling and if i feel strongly that there is a there is a significant fracture of the lateral condyle which i am dealing with i'll probably give him a slab and get an mri done even though it means that giving him sedation or okay. if i feel clinically that this is something which most likely i'll conserve or i may do a closed reduction and pinning it is fine if i do it after a few days 
I'll probably wait for about four to five days, allow the swelling and the pain to come down, allow the child to be more cooperative for a better X-ray, and probably get an X-ray done after about five to seven days. And these epiphyseal injuries, which you showed around the knee joint, sometimes see in few years back when I attended a pediatric orthopedic seminar. So there, uh, Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan was telling me that you should always see for tenderness. Yeah. If there is a tenderness around the physis, then you should be suspecting that it's a physial injury, especially if the patient is not able to bear weight. So in these type of cases where the x-ray is almost normal, you're not able to make out even after the oblique x-rays. Will you get an MRI done or you'll wait for two, three days before you get an MRI? That's done? Right. So if it is significantly tender, there is significant swelling, I'll probably get an MRI done. Hmm. Okay. But usually once I, I am, so I typically try to supervise or at least have someone supervise that oblique x-ray. Hmm. I, I, I know most radio technicians will be able to get a good quality AP and lateral view. But that oblique x-ray should be in the control of the orthopedic surgeon. It just takes a few seconds. You just go there, see to it that that oblique x-ray is done to perfection like you want. Mm, the last question will be on the hip. So if you're suspecting a septic hip yeah. and the x-ray patient has come with an x-ray normal, so what would be your choice of investigation? A sonography? Or an MRI, depending on the is it depending on the age of the patient? How does it work? So typically, in almost ninety to ninety-five percent of cases, I will specifically advise for an MRI. Okay. The reason is, uh, and I strongly suspect a septic hip. I always, almost always do a MRI. The reason is many a times in ultrasound, the the quality of the ultrasound is not constant even in a place like Mumbai. And it is extremely operator dependent. Secondly, MRI will also be able to pick up concomitant osteomyelitis, concomitant other small abscesses which may need to be drained. So what I typically do, I usually send it to a place where there's an MRI and where I can admit at the same place. Okay. So I tell them to go there, get an MRI done, get admitted with the understanding that this may require surgery in most of the cases. Mm -hmm. And the septic hips, do you operate uh, in the middle of the night also? You do it in the next day morning when it comes to you in the I afternoon? It comes in the afternoon or evening OPD. Yeah. So, uh, there have been many, many articles in the Western literature where they say you have to do it as early as possible. However, in our Indian setting, most of the kids come to us after about two to three days of symptoms at a minimum. Hmm. Most of the time, they have been given some antibiotics somewhere. They have been given some suppressive drugs like and antibiotics and anti-inflammatory someday. So I don't mind waiting till the next day morning to get him operated. It's not something that he is extremely acute and he has come within the 12 hours so that my waiting over overnight is going to make any difference. So except for a vascular injury, would you operate anything else at night? Almost none. What about a supracondylar pink pulseless? Yeah, so pink pulseless and I'll probably operate. Uh, though there are people who are, are fine to wait, it all depends on, on how severely painful. A child with a pink pulseless, pulseless hand with a severely displaced supracondylar, is some, a child who is extremely painful, hmm. is extremely uncomfortable. So I would like to do it as early as possible. However, as early as possible means also having his starvation period over. And if that starvation period is going to get over at say 3 a.m. in the night, I might as well do it early morning at 7 a.m. Because those 3-4 hours is not going to make a difference. Unless it's like a white hand where mm. there, is an, there is a definite vascular injury. A pink pulseless hand is basically an uh, artery in spasm. So I might wait for a few hours till the starvation period is over as well as the entire team is, uh, is fit. And, uh, so have you, uh, so in the, uh, how frequently do you do angiography for pink pulseless hand? Almost none. Okay. So, uh, it's, so we should remember that it's a pink pulseless hand. So mm. hand is vascular and the artery has gone in spasm. Mm. So I will fix it first, then check out, then see the waveform of the pulse socks, then see the vascularity. As long as the child's capillary refill remains pink, I'm, I'm going to be comfortable. It has been shown in many papers, especially the one from Ganga, that the, the actual Pulse can return till about six weeks to eight weeks also. So I'll probably wait till the time the hand remains vascular. I'm not going to do an, do an angiography unless 
it's a white ant it's a avascular ant so in your experience uh, have you has after surgery any hand or pink pulses and turned white any I'm case of your wooden table here i'm touching that and ah. saying that okay theek hai okay thank you very much so we end this webinar we have end this webinar we thank dr mandar agashe to take out his time uh, from his schedule uh, for us and we also thank our uh, sponsors gsk we makers of iodex ultra gel thank you very much and good night to all